1988, Julie Ward embarked on an African odyssey driven by a passion for wildlife photography. However, just before her journey's end, she vanished without a trace. Her inexplicable disappearance ignited a 35-year-long crusade led by her father, dedicated to uncovering the haunting truth behind her untimely demise. This is the disturbingly heartbreaking case of Julie Ward. Julianne Ward was born on April 20, 1960, in Suffolk, England. Julie grew up with her two younger brothers, Tim and Bob, and her parents, John and Jan Ward. Her father, John, was a successful businessman in the hospitality industry and owned a chain of hotels which allowed the family to live a comfortable life in England. Growing up, Julie was described by her family as a beautiful, intelligent, and kind girl. Julie loved animals and had a passion for photography. It is this combination of interests which led her to take a year off from her job as a publisher's assistant in Suff, England in order to pursue her passion on the 7th of February, 1988. When Julie was 28, she left her home in England accompanied by 26 other travelers, their destination Kenya, Africa, in order to photograph wildlife. Julie had hoped to capture the annual migration of wilder beasts in the Misai Mara region by the end of her trip while staying in Nairobi. Julie met an elderly couple named Paul and Natasha Well Dixon. The couple had a large estate and would often rent out their grounds as a campsite to travelers. They had taken a liking to Julie who shared their love for dogs and they allowed Julie to camp on their grounds for much of the month of July. She later rented a cottage from the couple's neighbor in August of 1988 on the 2nd of September. Julie and her Australian friend, a biologist, Glenn Burns, drove to Messiah Mara and Julie's second-hand Suzuki Jeep, which she had purchased in Nairobi. The two had planned to watch the annual wildebeest migration from neighboring Tanzania's Serengeti National Park. Into the Mara, they set up camp at the Sand River campground the next day. The two drove across the park, but were interrupted in their travels by their jeep breaking down a tour truck driven by a man named Stephen Watson, rescued them by towing them to Mars Arena Lodge. The two stayed at the lodge for the day and hoped to return to Nairobi. The FEF following day. Their bad luck continued, however, as they soon found out their jeep could not be fixed in time as there was a problem. With the fuel pump, and it had to be replaced as Glenn had to attend a conference the next day at the Nairobi Museum. He flew to Niobe on his own, leaving Julie behind. Glenn, however, took the faulty fuel pump with him and promised to send a replacement. He sent that replacement pump on the 5th of September. However, it arrived late in the day, so Julie spent yet another night at the Mars Serena Lodge on September 6th. Around midday, Julie left Serena Lodge for Sand River Campground. Her plan was to collect the two tents that she and Glenn had left on site three days prior, and after grabbing her gear, her intention was to head to Nairobi. David Nyoko, a clerk at the Sand River Campground, saw Julie at around 2 p.m. inside the campground. He recalls that she dismantled the two tents and then paid the extra charges for their storage. She then left the campground at 2.30 p.m., driving off towards Kark Lodge, seemingly on her way to Nairobi Police Constable Gerald Karori, said he helped Julie dismantle the tent and also witnessed her leaving around 2.30 p.m. He recalls that she left in her Jeep alone. This is the last supposed sighting of Julie Ward. She had booked a plane ticket back to England on the 10th of September. And before she was to leave, she had planned to spend some time with the Well Dixons when Julie did not show up on the 6th nor the 7th. The two got worried and contacted local hospitals and police stations along the Nairobi Mara Road, fearing that Julie might have been in an accident when she did not appear for her flight. On the 10th, the Well Dixons reported her missing and notified Julie's father, John Ward. John took a flight to Kenya, arriving on the 12th of September. By this point, Julie had been missing for six days. John organized the search for his daughter, using his own money with the help of the Well Dixons and a few friends that Julie had made. While living in Kenya using five aircrafts, they meticulously combed through the vast expanse of the Messi Mara Reserve, tirelessly searching for any trace of Julie or her Jeep. The search effort proved fruitful, as on Tuesday the 13th of September, Julie's Jeep was found abandoned in a ghoulie at a stream known as Mandu in the Marrow. However, there was no sign of Julie. The police were immediately notified of the Jeep's presence among the items found inside the car were a map, two bottles of beer, a pair of binoculars, as well as some personal belongings. John found the location of the car odd, given that it was off of the road and appeared to be heading towards the river. However, the SOS written in the dust on the roof of the Jeep filled him with hope. Perhaps Julie had her car break down again and had decided to walk on foot later that same day. Chief Game Morin Simon Noel Malala stumbled upon a suspicious burnt-out campfire. The campfire was located near Ole MC Gate upon further inspection. He discovered human remains amidst the ashes. 
John rushed to the scene in the ashes. He found a left leg Jaws spinal column and a lock of hair. A skull was found in a nearby bush one month later. The rest of the body appeared to have been burnt to ashes. John in a later interview said, quote, The fire was about 4T in diameter. In it, there was a mug, some burnt sunglasses, and film cassettes. Even though I knew it had to be Julie, I wanted to go through the ashes to see if there was something I could find and identify. The odor was one of burnt flesh. The fire itself was black and oily. I could find nothing that I could identify. The gathered evidence was peculiar, lacking any signs of a struggle nor blood. There was also the faint smell of petrol. The first autopsy was done by Kenyan police pathologist Dr. Adele Shaker, who confirmed that the remains were that of Julie Ward in his report. Dr. Shaker noted that among other things, the remains had been cut using a sharp implement, and there were subsequent attempts at burning them to him. This pointed towards a clear case of homicide. However, the official investigation into Julie's death presented a conflicting narrative while Dr. Shaker unequivocally deemed Julie's death a homicide, stating that the leg was cleanly cut and drenched in petrol before being set on fire. The police disputed this conclusion. Instead, they proposed a theory suggesting Julie was struck by lightning and subsequently mauled by a wild animal such as a lion. When a copy of the autopsy report was eventually seen by her father, it was crudely altered with words crossed out or typed over. John said, quote, where Dr. Shaker had typed cleanly cut as far as the leg and jaw were concerned, these words had been changed to torn and cracked. You were starting to talk about an attack by animals and not human beings. It was later found that the autopsy results had been altered by Dr. Shaker's boss, Dr. Jason Caviti, a health advisor to the Kenyan government, in a later interview. Dr. Shaker said, quote, he took the report. I heard him saying, no, 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 and saw him underline through some words I saw him underline through the words, cleanly cut. He said it was only my opinion I wasn't happy about this, but Dr. Caviti was my boss. John took Julie's remains to England, and a second post-mortem was carried out by Professor Austin Gam. This second autopsy confirmed Dr. Shaker's initial findings. The investigating police officer in charge of the case, Superintendent Maui Wanhao, speculated that Julie may have been depressed and may have gone on to commit suicide. He further suggested that Julie was sexually promiscuous. Dr. Shaker said Superintendent Wan Zhao told him that Julie was, quote, a loose girl. The superintendent spoke of Sue and how she could have cut herself up and may have lit a fire which could have spread Kenyan investigators were reluctant to call the death the murder and refused to conduct a homicide investigation. John Ward accused the Kenyan government of wanting to cover up the murder in order to protect the country's tourism industry. Due to this, John Ward decided to launch an investigation of his own. Over the years, he has made several trips in a desperate search for the truth. Following the discrepancies in the autopsy report, an inquest was held into Julie's death in Nairobi during the inquest when questioned about the alterations of Julie's death certificate. Dr. Kaviti defaulted Dr. Shaker's English arguing that the Egyptian's command of the English language was poor, and that his own motive in altering the report was only for the purposes of precision. Yet at the same hearing, Dr. Kaviti admitted that out of hundreds of autopsy reports Dr. Shaker had written in the past, this was the first time his lack of English precision had necessitated the editing of his report being inky also heard the findings of Professor Austin Graham, who confirmed Dr. Shaker's findings stating that the injuries on Julie's jaw and her school indicated she had been decapitated from behind with a sharp blade, the magistrate eventually concluded that Julie was murdered by a person or persons unknown. However, he ordered that no further investigation was required in February of 1990. At John's urging, the UK Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd sanctioned an inquiry by Scotland Yard investigators, who subsequently traveled to Kenya in order to probe Julie's case. The initial investigation led to the conclusion that two park rangers, Peter Capon and John McGorry, were responsible for Julie's murder. The investigation revealed evidence placing Julie at the gatepost. Both rangers had been in the Mesimara Reserve that day. Linking them to the scene, however, during the subsequent trial confusion arose regarding the clerk and the police constable's testimonies. The clerk David N. Choco and the police constable Gerald Karori were the last people to see Julie when she left Sand River Campground to go towards Nairobi. They came under suspicion during the inquest when Scotland Yard detectives were able to prove that Julie's signature had actually been forged. The clerk, David, had entered Julie Ward's details in the gate register and had signed her name to make it appear that she had signed herself out of the game reserve. Initially, David remained adamant that Julie herself had signed out and had left the Mara after handwriting experts confirmed that it was not Julie Ward's handwriting. David admitted that actually he had made the entry 
and had signed against Julie Ward's name afterwards. He said it was not because he wanted to create the impression that she had left the Mara when, when he knew she had not, but because he had forgotten to give her the register to sign when she had already left. He says that as she was already gone, he was forced to sign on her behalf in order to save himself from possible disciplinary action for lacking vigilance in his work while both the clerk and the police constable claimed they saw Julie leave the campground alone. A later unnamed witness told investigators that they had actually seen an armed man in military fatigue sitting inside of her car. Despite this, all four individuals, the two park rangers, the clerk, and the EI, Police constable were acquitted due to insufficient evidence later the chief warden of the reserve, Simon Mala, became a suspect himself, after it was found that he had actually not ordered a search for Julie by any of the 113 rangers under his command at 11 a.m. on the day Julie's jeep was spotted. MAA was informed immediately, however, rather than swiftly heading to oversee the ground search. He instead drove 50 kilometers in the opposite direction to Serena Lodge not until mid-afternoon did he eventually reach the scene by then, more than 30 individuals, including rangers, police, and council workers, had already been there and departed for the search before towing away the vehicle police removed Julie's personal belongings and transported them to Sandra over police post for safekeeping among the items removed were maps, a pair of chainers, two bottles of beer binoculars, and various other items such as tents and sleeping bags. When Ma'ala finally arrived on the scene at 300 p.m., there was no one at the vehicle, however, during the trial of the two park rangers. Mala told the judge that after he arrived on scene, he quote, peeked inside and in the car he said said he saw maps, a pair of shoes, two bottles of beer and a pair of binoculars. These items had already been removed by police three hours prior to Ma's arrival. Therefore, investigators noted that he must have had prior information about the Jeep. Suspicions also grew that someone else besides Julie had driven the Jeep to the location where it was found. It seemed odd that Julie had decided to turn off of the main road drive across the trackless rock-strewn bush an attempt to drive through a deep gully. While all the while the much safer and paved road was nearby, this casted further suspicion on Mala, whose story seemed to be ever-changing. Mala claimed that he did not drive Julie's Jeep, nor did he ever drive any vehicle. However, several witnesses, including his own chauffeur, claimed that he often took over the driving. In fact, he even drove John Ward during the initial search for Julie during the investigation. The police uncovered records of a motor accident involving a vehicle that MCA had been driving. Moreover, MAA had radioed at 4.26 p.m. to say that he had found Julie's remains. It was later discovered that MAA had left the goalie where Julie's Jeep was found at 400 p.m. for him to have found the body at 4.26. It would have taken him only 26 minutes to cover the 10 kilometers journey in a southeasterly direction in a desolate corner of the Maasai Mara. When police tried to retrace Ma's path, they discovered the quickest journey from the goalie to the site of Julie's remains took precisely 26 minutes. This would mean that he traveled directly from Julie's abandoned car to her remains the area where Julie's hack body was discovered, had no car tracks leading to it, and is identifiable only by a distinctly shaped large tree set among dozens of other smaller trees and bushes. The hidden and secret nature of the environment in which Julie was discovered directly contradicted Mola's claim that his search was merely that of chance. His story of finding Julie's remains randomly was met by much public and private speculation. Those close to the case say such insider knowledge suggests that MAA probably had prior information about this specific location he claims he was led by vultures circling in the sky. But it was pointed out that you could not see an elephant at that distance, much less the speck of vultures circling in the sky. A Swiss TV crew had offered their assistance to the investigation, using five radio-equipped vehicles in the search for Julie. However, Emicella told them to mind their own business. The crew had also heard rumors about Jonathan Moy, son of then Kenyan President Daniel Adoy, somehow being involved in the murder of Julie the crew, had heard rumors that Jonathan had been seen with a group of men in the very same park. The Swiss TV crew recorded their account at Mula's office prior to leaving Kenya. They said that they found Mala sitting head in his hands, saying that he had been summoned to a meeting with President Moy just days after Julie's remains were found. M. Ella disappeared from his post at the park. At first, the official line was that he was, quote, on leave, but it was later found he'd been suspended. He never returned to his position of senior warden of the Messi Mara game reserve one afternoon while Julie's father was in Kodak Lodge. He met a woman who told him, quote, the man who killed your daughter is Jonathan Moy. She said that she had heard allegations about Jonathan Moy everywhere in the park, particularly in the nearby village where Julie's remains were discovered. 
Later, a letter was sent from Kenya to the UK in which an unidentified writer recounted an incident from September of 1988, the exact same time that Julie went missing. The writer employed at Kodok Lodge described standing near the lodge's gas station waiting for transportation home. She remembered seeing three men dragging a white woman from a Land Rover into the government guest house, which was reserved for heads of state and VIPs only substantiating this further. In 1992, Valentine Orotipo, part of a secret militia allegedly paid for by President Moy to target his political adversaries, claimed in an interview that Julie was killed at Jonathan Moy's direction, and in the presence of others, the Kenyan government has since refuted the existence of such training camps and has denied Kipo's employment by them. In September of 1995, Sipo spoke openly to the UK Daily Mail, stating that he witnessed Julie's murder himself. He asserted that Jonathan Moy ordered for her to be killed after allegedly SC assaulting her. Jonathan Moy denied any involvement in the case. He claimed he was on his family farm at Alama Ravine, 250 kilometers away from Mara at the time of Julie's death. Due to his status and lack of evidence, nothing could link him to the crime, and therefore no investigation was done. Valentine Sipo fled Kenya in fear for his life after making such testimony and lived in exile until his death. Some suggested that Julie may have witnessed illicit activities and was consequently killed for what she knew others speculated she may have worked for the British intelligence agency and that she may have taken pictures of militia camps in the Mara. Such actions, they say, could easily get one murdered in the desert in 1997. The director of criminal investigations in Kenya appointed a new team of detectives in order to examine the evidence. In Julie's case, Mala was finally charged with Julie's murder. The DCI said that it was evident MAA had not only deceived authorities about his awareness of the items in Julie's car, but that he was also deceptive about his knowledge of the whereabouts of her remains and that he covered up her murder. Despite all this, he was acquitted due to lack of evidence. In 2012, John published a report in Nairobi Law Monthly claiming that Jonathan Moy killed Julie. He gave all of the information he had gathered over the years and published it for the world to see in the report. He revealed that in 2009, former superintendent Muchiri Wan Zhao, who had originally suggested that Julie's death was a suicide, contacted him to talk about what he now considered was Julie's murder. Wano claimed that after interviewing a number of civilians, rangers, and police officers, he had suspected Jonathan M.O. for Julie's murder. However, he said that when he went to his senior officer with this information, he was told to, quote, look somewhere else. He then says he was forced to change his story and avoid any mention that Julie was murdered. He also claimed that MAA was not involved in Julie's murder directly, but that he was told to get rid of her body. He finished his conversation saying that he wanted to meet John again and show him some papers on the various people interviewed. However, John never heard from him. He was later told that Wano had died. However, the circumstances surrounding his death was never released to the media. In the report, he also spoke of an informant who had previous ties with Jonathan Moy. This informant shared details and presented photographs of himself with Jonathan Moy, the informant alleged that on September 6th of 1988, Jonathan, accompanied by his farm manager, his bodyguards, and his driver, encountered Julie along their route through the M. Sai Mara. He says that the conversation turned aggressive, resulting in Julie being sewily assaulted by Jonathan the informant, claimed that fearing Julie might report the assault. Jonathan instructed his bodyguards to kill her. The informant disclosed the names and locations of the bodyguards, the driver and the farm manager. Additionally, he mentioned mentioned that the farm manager, Ibrahim Chog, was married to one of President Moy's daughters and was a close personal friend to Jonathan Moy. Ibrahim supposedly distanced himself from his friend Jonathan due to these events. Allegedly, during an argument between the two, Ibrahim was heard to shout at Jonathan in anger. Quote, one day, I will blacken your name around the world for what you did to that girl in the Mara. In 1999, Ibrahim was killed in a car accident when John Ward met Ibrahim's father. He claimed that Ibrahim was not actually the victim of a car accident, but that he had been murdered. He said that an autopsy report revealed marks on his wrists resembling rope imprints and significant bruises all over his body, indicating severe blunt force trauma. The fellow grieving father said that the doctor suspected Ibrahim had likely been suspended by his wrists and beaten fatally damaging his spleen. The father recounted details from a witness who say they saw a wooden log being placed across the road which caused Ibrahim's car to swerve and crash. The witness says they observed Ibrahim retrieving a briefcase from the vehicle before being attacked by three hooded men. The witness said that initially she believed it was a robbery, despite authorities labeling Ib's death as an accident. His father believes his son was murdered due to the fact that he was about to reveal what he knew about Julie's death. 
He says that he was killed by Jonathan's associates in order to keep him quiet. Julie's father also reported that in 2004, a former Kenyan intelligence officer disclosed that he witnessed Julie's brutal murder in an anonymous interview with the Kenyan newspaper. He claimed that three men in the reserve assaulted and then murdered her. Her the officer detailed how Julie was coerced to drive her Jeep miles from the Sand River camp, positioning it in a goalie. He says that she was then forced to create an SOS mark in dust on the roof of her car, suggesting an accident and a subsequent POL for help. The officer admitted to being too frightened to intervene at the time and said that he remained fearful of coming forward even years later. In 2018, Julie's father asked authorities to get the DNA of Jonathan Moy to confirm if he was responsible for his daughter's murder. However, nothing came of it. In 2019, Jonathan Moy died of pancreatic cancer. His father, the former president of Kenya, passed away two months later. With the death of both men, John Ward hoped that those who previously felt afraid to speak up would now summon the courage to come forward so far. There has been no updates on the case, and nobody has come forward to add additional details. Julie's father dedicated 35 years of relentless pursuit and seeking justice for his daughter's killer. His commitment led to over 200 trips to Kenya. Spending more than two million pounds of his own money in his tireless quest, he meticulously gathered evidence interviewed. Witnesses dug out a latrine near the scene of the crime in case any of Julie's possessions were thrown there and even preserved DNA in his own freezer. Every parent wants to know what happened, but I, I take it a step further. I do want to catch the person who did it. She must died a very lonely death. Terror pain. You know, couldn't have been worse. Uh, and it's unacceptable to us that someone who we think is catchable should get away with doing that through the shadows of the uncertainty of the case. His resolve stood unshaken. Each inquiry, a testament to his unwavering quest, tragically. John Ward passed away on June 7th, 2023, shortly after his wife Jan's burial on May 25th after John's death. His sons Bob and Tim said they would continue their father's mission in both his and Julie's honor. If you like what we do and want to see more, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Thank you.